You know, I look across the congregation, and there's all kinds of people here that I know. They all have different issues. Some have issues with their children. Some have issues with their spouses. Some have issues with their jobs. I can look across the room and see faces that I know. But we all have something in common, more than one thing, which is the way we, in general, as a principle, as the way we come to God, as the way we come into fellowship with God, into his presence, through grace, prevenient grace, and justification, which is a subject that I have not I have not dealt with as in-depth as Dr. Scott did, but the idea that we understand how we came. Now, there are people that come in from different churches, and they'll use expressions like, uh, I found the Lord. Well, the Lord's never been lost. You were. That's the condition we all have in common. We were lost, and God, at whatever time, Whatever that time was, decided, now's the time. But not everybody who comes into the church, this church or the body as a whole, has a clear understanding of the target that you are. You know, when you were out in the world, you've heard me say this before, and you were living in the world, and you didn't have any frame of reference about the Bible or about God, well, you'd be like me and say, God exists. The devil left you alone. You are the perfect individuals for his aim as a target. Now, when people begin to talk about these types of things, they say, okay, you know, well, maybe you have your own idea of spiritual attacks that come. I'll tell you one who had it right in history, Hugh Latimer. I have a quote from him here. In one of his sermons, he asked, who is the most diligent bishop in all England? The most diligent bishop. He said, I'll tell you, it's the devil. He's in his diocese every Sunday and all the time. In other words, he's got his territory, and he makes sure to not leave it. That's too bad that modern-day church and preaching you know, we don't have the same sense of fear and trepidation about our spirituality. You've heard me now going on 13 years talk about things you see on TV. I've seen them. You've seen them. They actually make a mockery out of the very essence of what we're supposed to be here for. Now, if I'm offending anybody... That's perfectly fine, because I'm not here to please anybody today. I am here to do one thing, which probably will make the devil very angry, which is to remind some of you of just how big a walking target you are. We don't, we don't necessarily, I say we, but I'll speak for myself and let, let the message by God's Spirit bring conviction to your heart. I don't want to put something on you and say you. Let God's Spirit bring conviction upon you the tendency is sometimes to walk and either walk with blinders or walk, you know, you got earphones on, you can't hear anything else, and you forget that there is such a thing as the desire to have you. Now, you know, I know, as I've said a lot of times, you read the Bible and you can read it and it's something that's so far removed. Back there in Job, have you considered my servant Job? And I think about Satan considering Job, who wasn't some guy out on the street, being ludicrous now, he wasn't a guy that was out on the street selling drugs or getting high or whatever, you know, Christians say, oh, that's, that's why the devil's on your back. Here's a guy who appears to be a family man and a man of God. His wife says, curse God and die. And he, he basically says, can I receive the good and not take the bad? We in our labeling would say, Job was a good person. He didn't do anything bad. And yet, there is this passage that talks about Satan 
considering Job and ask you, just as I will ask of myself, because I never preach anything to you that I don't speak to my heart first. I'm ministering to me and to you. That you don't forget the fact that you're being considered. Now, when we use that word, consider, it sounds like you're going to receive an award. You're being considered for something. But the consideration here isn't about an award. The consideration is the fact that just as the call to Jesus' disciples, go out and make your fishermen, go out and become fishers of men, you don't think that the devil knows that call as well through the eons of time to be able to caricature it? and twist it just a bit so that people come into the church thinking they indeed have a high and precious calling when in fact they're doing, no, they're doing nothing except spinning on a wheel, going in no direction. There's never any growth. There's never any movement. I've told you real growth for the Christian happens when God dangles you for a little bit over the fire, you get out a step or a famine hits. That's when growth comes, because that's when you figure out whether or not all the messages that you've heard for your whole entire Christian life, whether that's a month or 50 years, actually have any bearing on your soul, because what is this, what is this that we're doing if at the end there's not some application somewhere applied to the soul? So I ask you to think about this, not to respond. It's a rhetorical quiet in the mind. Are you being considered? Now, there's passages in the Bible as the Apostle Paul, Silas, and Timothy were heading off to Thessalonica. And Thessalonians says, And Satan, Satan hindered them from going there. Whether that hindrance was a, a tumult that came that prevented them, whether it was people or however you want to say, whatever that was, Satan hindered them. It wasn't the Lord. The Lord didn't hinder. It doesn't say the Lord hindered. There's other places where it says the Lord held back something. Here it says Satan hindered us. And I think, again, just as I ask you to consider whether or not you think you're being considered by the devil, whether or not you can look at yourself in your walk, there's a little bit of spiritual inventory to ask, if Satan hasn't been hindering you in your progress. And I told you, don't think I'm pointing fingers at you. I speak to myself first. It's important for me, the thing that Paul says, to check and to see if we are in the faith. There's no thing that says you better check and see that you look right or that you're acting right, but check and see if you be in the faith. That's the criteria right there. It's very easy for people to slip in and out of that. You know, to act like you're going through some motion of something. But the faithing activity comes when you're holding on and you don't let go. And not like that guy out of uh, Don Quixote, whatever his name was. You know, he was, it was dark and he fell out the window and he was holding on to the windowsill. You know that story? He was holding on the whole night. His hands were tired. His, everything was burning because he had the fear that he would fall to his death. The whole night he panicked about this grip, and when sunlight came, he was only two feet off the ground. <laughs> you'll go find that story somewhere, and you'll say, oh, that one. Sometimes we're not taking the spiritual inventory, so we end up putting all of our effort, like this man hanging on, hanging on the windowsill, but for where, where the real things matter, we pay little or no attention. I'm asking you to consider what you may be being analyzed and watched at. You know, we, we talk about passages in the Bible. There's a passage that talks about the devil as a, as a roaring lion, seeking prey. Well, that means he is a talented hunter with great skill. And any hunter with great skill will analyze and watch, consider, and perhaps even hinder. See, there's two things that I would say for all of us to take note about. This ministry, this ministry is a great ministry because we do nothing else here except I bring the Word of God. There are places where you can go and spiritually develop, but it's not going to be the type of development that counts for eternity. 
And I think a lot of people are hindered by Satan. You know, what's the point? Why should I do it? Why should I invest my time? This is an investment, by the way, for some people to carve an hour or two out of their Sunday morning because they've got more important things to do, which is disturbing to me because when I think about eternity, I have nothing more important to do with my time now than to know about God which brings me to the next bullet point in my brain. I wonder how many of us really have the right perspective on what we're doing here. Because if the perspective is right, the attitude is right. And if the attitude towards the things of God is right, everything else falls into place, including the fact that you're a target. How many people here answer the phones? You come in and you answer the phones. You take all these great messages of people watching on TV. Yeah, you in your living room right now. This is great. I love this. I want to be there. Why do you think they don't come? They, something made them pick up the phone and call. They don't have to call in. They called in. doesn't matter if there was a crawl. They took the effort to pick up the phone. You don't think that Satan is busy hindering those people? whether it's putting fear in their heart, fear of the unknown, fear of what might happen if they come in the church. Oh, my goodness, will it be like that, or will they have me do something else? People have all these ideas, but then Satan comes and surfboards on it. And there's your hindrance for those people who I often pray for. I read the messages, and I think, wow. Do you realize if every single person who called in showed up, we'd have to turn people away at the door? I've told you that before. That requires some heavy-duty prayer, for those people to resist, and they probably haven't been taught how to resist the devil. Now, you may think that spiritual warfare is not or shouldn't be the top of your list, but it should be. The scripture also says that we are not ignorant of Satan's devices, his schemes, his methods. So let me go back to the hunter, the talented, gifted hunter who can watch and know. No person goes out to hunt or to fish, whatever you're looking for, that doesn't educate themselves a little bit about what they're going after and how to get it. Can you please think about that for a minute? Because that pertains to you and to me. No hunter. Think of somebody who's just going to go out on a safari. You've you got to get a little education here of if you're going to use a rifle, how to use a rifle. You're not going to take some novice who doesn't know how to shoot and say, here, help yourself. You'll probably get shot in the head before they shoot a critter. The point is Satan is not like that. He watches, he observes, which brings me back to Satan considering Job, knowing very well the stuff that this man was made out of. So it's mind-boggling to me that we can go through week after week, and yes, there's spiritual warfare teaching that plays on the network, that you wouldn't think that you're being watched and targeted. This is not a scare tactic. I don't want you to be here today and say, wow, I'm, I'm scared about what she said. I want you to be cognizant of it because there's only one way to fight the devil. And you can't do it with caricatures and you can't do it with imagination. There's only one way. The Bible describes a few methods, if you will, for mankind, but there's only one way. And in your own flesh, forget about it. That's not even worth talking about. Now, there's other passages where the devil's described as turning himself into an angel of light. You know, the people that tell you you're wasting your time here. Some of you who are committed volunteers, your friends or your family say, this is a waste of time. They're an angel of light to you. By the way, if you can't put this in perspective, then I'm going to sound like a crazy person. And frankly, I'm going to tell you something. I'm at the stage in my life where I don't care if people think I'm a little nutty about this because this is the one thing I've come to know. You cannot walk around saying, I'm a Christian. I, whatever it is you want to boast about, God says that means nothing to me. Your righteousness, your ideas of your righteousness, they mean nothing. In fact, the devil will get on on those people and he surfboards on that just found a sucker who thinks he or she's doing something so great for God. Well, let me ask you something. The fact that Paul was hindered by Satan, and I think he was pretty important. He had a pretty important mission 
as a converted Jew going to preach Christ through all of Asia Minor and other parts of the world, writing two-thirds of the New Testament, and Satan hindered him. That's, that's pretty special. Well, now let me give you the flip side, because some people think they're so special, they're doing something so great, but the Bible says you are his workmanship. Maybe Satan gets in your head, or the devil whispers in your ear, you're not the Apostle Paul, you're not preaching a message, you're not doing anything important, so you're so unimportant that it doesn't matter. Let me go back to what I just said. You are his workmanship. That makes you pretty important people. The book of Ephesians, which I spent a lot of time in this week, talks about you who are chosen, you who are called out from among other people who were not, and then begins to talk about the unity, which I'll get to in a minute, of the faith which is required for the body to function as the body of Christ. Paul goes on to say somewhere else, if our gospel is hid, it's hid to those who are lost. Why? Because the prince of this world has blinded their eyes and they cannot see. So somebody listening to me says, well, that's utter foolishness, let alone talking about the devil, and she wants me to hear about the gospel of Christ. That's right, because he says, lest that gospel should shine unto them, essentially, and salvation should come to them. It's a mystery. I still, I still think this after all these years. It's a mystery of why God would come preveniently and open my eyes. But not a mystery that Satan desires to have me or to have you. Because, again, I digress to the book of Ephesians, which talks about being translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. Well, you are all escaped prisoners of the darkness, beginning with me, but you all are. And the warden desires to gather the prisoners back. That's how you have to look at spiritual warfare. It's not as though some people say, well, but what about those people who are easily tempted? You make a mistake and you confuse how crafty the devil is with each and every individual. Now, the devil doesn't have foreknowledge. The devil is not like God where he knows the move before you make it. But if he's observing you, he knows your habit patterns. He knows your comings and goings. He observes. He's a hunter. He's very crafty. He can see. Now, you don't have to be a genius or a savant to see somebody gets in their car every morning at 8 a.m. and takes off, goes down to the coffee shop, gets their coffee, drives in the car, gets to work, goes to their... You know, it doesn't take a lot of savvy for that. Just watch, observe. Ah, I don't like the idea of you telling me somebody's watching me. Well, you better because there's somebody greater than the devil watching you. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, invisible, we're talking about invisible powers, invisible presence of God. Now, that's not to make people say, you know, now, now I've got to sit and watch and be careful about everything I do. You know, somebody's watching me. But what I'm telling you, the devil isn't really concerned with the faults and the cracks. And Jesus, he's seen them all. Bought up the whole field, all the rejects, all of them. So think about this. Temptation that comes, somebody will say, well, what about those people who are weak and who are tempted? Well, let me ask you something. Who is strong? Who, who is strong enough to say that when temptation comes... They're not even slanting one way towards the temptation. The Bible says that they're with the temptation, God will provide a way of escape. He'll provide an exit door for you to go through the book. He'll make a way for you to endure it. Some people think that means that you're going to be in the temptation. How about in, endure the bumpy ride of going through, but maybe not succumbing to it? And I've told you the pattern begins with Christ. This isn't the personal story of Melissa Scott or of somebody else in the room here. We're talking about the Lord himself being tempted by the devil. Now, you either believe this or you, oh, well, you know, it's in the Bible and I'm not sure about Well, if you're not sure about that, probably can't help you too much. But if you're quite sure about what I'm telling you, the devil didn't have any qualms about tempting Christ. In fact, if you look at the very things that he tempted him to, they are essentially covering a broad enough spectrum to have some bearing on each and every person in the sound of my voice 
their life, their activity, their actions. Turn these stones into bread. Take care of your belly first. Misuse the gifts that you've been given. You know how tired I am? I'm just going to tell you. I'm, I'm, I'm lamenting a little bit, and I probably shouldn't, but I am lamenting. I'm tired of people talking about God as the bestower and their search for and the quest to obtain things from God. I love what Tozer said. Tozer said, if you ask for a rose and you're not asking God, and that's a little bit ludicrous, but I love the stretch of this. He says, if you ask for a rose of God, but you're not asking God to be part of receiving that rose, all you're going to get is a thorn. And I love that because the idea is if you can't see or understand that the very thing you may be questing after, void of God's presence in it, seek ye first the kingdom of God, void of God being at the forefront of what you are requesting, is asking for something that will essentially be nothing. Or you may obtain it. And by the way, I don't say that it, this doesn't go two ways. The, the devil's great at striking deals. No, it's not. We're not, we're not, talking, about, we're not talking about Keith Richards. But... <laughs> But he's great at striking deals. And the deals never have a payout. They may have something in the now, but they never have the payout that you think you're going to get. And there's a whole history of people in this book that succumbed on one side or the other. The people that were around Moses thought, well, Moses is not the only guy who can do this. And you've got a whole band around him. Core and that band that figured, well, they found out real quickly that don't mess with God's person. You know, it's one thing if God's person says, it's not going to rain, and it doesn't rain, or the earth is going to swallow you up. But if the earth opens up and you see those people go in the earth, you better, you better figure out how to zip it. You might be next. I don't know. I, I haven't met anybody like that. I don't know people like that. I only know people who like to talk about the things they hear from the Lord. <laughs> I only know one of those people, which I also think the devil uses, by the way, because the devil likes to make sure that you, who would fall for that, would be thinking that this person has a better relationship with God than you do. And last time I checked... If we were to just strip everything bare and we were all going to stand right now, every single one of us would be no closer. We're not talking about a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit less, all the same. When you come to that point, it's a new reality check. There is no message somebody is going to say they heard personally and straight from the Lord about this thing that they must tell you. When in fact, the thing we're supposed to share is out of this book, which is what I'm doing with you right now. I want to make sure that, as I said, there's a little bit of a, a spiritual inventory going on because I detect, I'm not saying this of all the people, but I'm saying this, there's a vast majority of people who, they're, they're not under attack. They forget. They drop their guard. And there are two passages specifically I want to look at. I've mentioned a few. I've referenced a few things here. This is not a complicated message. I wanted it to be as straightforward that every single person could, by way of God's help, understand. My concern is watching people who cannot figure out that they are indeed targets walk around as though there's, there's, there's no issue. And that becomes the issue. It's not just attendance. It's not just giving. I stand here as a person who is, I have great conflict in my soul. And I, I'm conflicted. My conflict is, you know, when I, when I begin to articulate these things, it can sound a little bit, oh, wow, that's, that's out there. Well, my concern is for people's souls, which I, I can't see. I know faces here. I know people. But for your souls. I watch people who have thrown away years of being this ministry, another ministry. What, I don't, this is not about this ministry. We're talking about a walk with God. Thrown it away for whatever came their way seemed at the time better. 
but I don't think there's any harm in saying this because the lady I'm talking about was promoted probably a year or two ago now. I can't remember. But I've told you the story. She left. She had a key position in the ministry. She left because she felt after probably 20 years of serving, she was missing out. There was something in the world. She had to go and she had to go out there and find it. She came back afterwards. She came back. Um, I think she might have been married and divorced. I can't really remember. But she came back with a lot of heartache. And she came back. I'll never forget the day she came back and she said, it's pretty empty out there. I didn't find what I was looking for. And that's because you won't find it. You'll find temporal things that temporarily give you happiness. But if you've once tasted of the goodness of God and you go out to find something that you think is better, it'll be like sand through your fingers or wind through your hands. It's gone. It's not lasting because you've tasted something that at one point had an effect. It had an impact. Now the devil knows how to manipulate that too and tell you, go out there and find what you're looking for. You're missing out on something when in fact the only thing the devil wants you to miss out on is being eternally present with God. When you put that in perspective, that's why I have conflict inside. Because I don't think there's any amount of words the Holy Spirit has to help me today to reach inside of you. I I can't do it. And to get the lights turned on for some again, and the fire turned on for others, and an awareness for others. This is the conflict. The conflict isn't about, is this going to be a great ministry, small or little? That's That's God's problem. My problem is to take care of what's in front of me, what I can't see that's in front of me, and what's in front of me, and to remind you. As I said, only the Holy Spirit can bring this conviction. I'm not looking for people to feel guilty or to feel bad. Why? Because you can... This is is why I do what I do. You can always start over with God. So you've been failing for six months or a year or ten years. That's the grace of God, that God didn't just turn you over and you believe a strong delusion and a lie, and you're damned, and you don't care anymore. And so it's very easy for some to just say, I hear what she's saying, but no stirring. So I said, I prayed. Ask God, please. I don't have to beg for God's Spirit, but please help me through the Spirit, and may the Spirit help and give that awareness today. Because that's what the battle's over. Now, the book of Ephesians. Can't come to church and not open your Bibles. Briefly, because we've only gone through the book of Ephesians many, many, many times. Can't tell you how many, but it's numerous. But chapter 1, you've got the called, those saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, the called And if you keep moving through, you've got those that are chosen. That's the fourth verse of the first chapter. Chose us in him. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. This should all bring illumination that if God deigned to put his hand on me and his life in me, of course, I'm a marked person. It's kind of glorious when you think about it. I mean, in in a weird way, it's kind of scary, but it's also kind of glorious to know that God put his hand on me, and there's, there's no reason why somebody should be under attack, be tempted, be hindered, be considered, be observed, unless you have a part in God's kingdom. That's, that's kind of the mind-boggling part. If you don't think that's mind-boggling, then it's okay, but it's mind-boggling for me, and it's still mind-boggling after all these years. I don't take it for granted. If you move through the book of Ephesians, the second chapter talks about new life from sin and death, where he says, the Apostle Paul is writing when he says, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Speaking of the devil, he walked according to that and so did I. Don't let some person who's a perfectionist or a fundamentalist lay some trip on you. They were there too. 
That's why, you know, you can say a lot of things about me, but I'm, I am a real individual, and I understand there isn't anybody in the sound of my voice, not a one. I don't care how high you want to go in the religious institutions, if you want to find somebody who's like Mother Teresa in the streets, you know, people say, oh, this person's a saint. Well, they're a saint for the, the terminology as we understand it. But there is no such creature walking the face of the planet that wasn't a child of darkness. That's how we all start. And some of us just spend more time resisting, and some of us decide maybe it's better there. Oh, I should have said that's the other place the devil likes to play with those who come, is they think, like the children of Israel, it'll be better if we go back to Egypt. At least we know what we were getting there. This God, we don't, this God, this Moses, this whatever, we don't know what's going to happen. And I think that's a typical thing. Too many people coming to Kadesh Barney and not realizing that the test was that. Would you trust God? That he'll protect you? That he'll build a hedge around you? That if you look unto him, he knows exactly how to deliver you from the one who is pursuing you. This is why important parts of James, don't throw James out. He says, resist the devil. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. There's something that we have to be cognizant of. And with that reality going on, and with our faith and our trust in Christ, we can be victors. The battle, after all, is the Lord's about you. So this second chapter, second verse I just read, where it says, Where in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our behavior, our living, King James, our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And then he goes on to give the, but God, which is wonderful. So he doesn't exclude himself, and neither do I. And goes on to talk about Jew and Gentile. Still in the second chapter, talking about how Jew and Gentile were far off, but are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And why am I doing this? Because I'm going to get to where I want to be to show you that if you go back and reread Ephesians, you might find some new insight, as I think I did. The third chapter is Paul talking about, as he is the privileged prisoner who is also the proclaimer, talking about the mystery. And I'm not talking about it in a way that I think is mystical, but the mystery that he talks about whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which is the mystery of his calling and his being the proclaimer. And then he prays for the Ephesians. And now I'm focusing in to try and make a point here. The fourth chapter begins a whole section on unity. And within that fourth chapter, there are diversities within the body of Christ, but still united. That means not all may be walking on the same spiritual plane. Some, it seems like they never deviate and some are constantly falling down. Some are more strong, others more feeble. Uh, just a, a whole diversity within the body, yet still one body. And then he speaks of the fact that God gave gifts to the ministry for the purpose of unifying the body in the unity of the faith. And then he begins to talk about the old and new man. And it's in this fourth chapter that I want to lift up something which will bring me back to unity. And this is, I could not have done this without giving these overviews of the chapters because those who are called, those who are chosen, and he goes back to say, but you're all chosen children of darkness now put into the glorious light. This is a mystery, and it's the mystery of Christ that he was given to know and unfold that then he begins to talk about this unification in the body, which is the putting off of the old man, the putting on of the new, unity with Christ. And the fourth chapter, beginning at um, about the 17th verse. You know, I always read this 
fourth and fifth chapters. I always read this, but I always read it somewhat out of context. I read these as individual items and individual information, but I didn't read it as a concept of my unity and my union with Christ and the things that can actually separate me from Christ. Now, that's a different subject, but these are, there's a reason for me highlighting this, which has much to do with the subject of spiritual warfare, attacks of the devil, and how the devil may use some of these things because it is to drive a wedge from the unity of the faith, the new man in Christ or the new woman in Christ, a new way of thinking, speaking the truth in love in Christ versus the falsehoods, the bitterness, all of the things that are naturally engrafted unto man from the fall, which are uniquely used of the devil, almost like with a magnifying glass, to separate and drive the wedge that ultimately people who succumb, without looking at this this way in this light, they'll just, it's just, these are just uh, ways to live your life. Someone will write a book and say, these are ways to live your life without understanding their concepts to keep your union with Christ and to fight the devil at the same time. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have, been give, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that she put off concerning the former King James conversation behavior, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man after which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. I'll read just a little bit more, but I want to come back to that 27th verse for a reason. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Again, there's this unity concept. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. There's the other part of this union, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now, let me go back to that 27th verse where it says, Neither give place to the devil. There are some translations that have attached the neither give place to the devil to let not the sun go down upon your wrath. I didn't want to get involved in whether or not that should be attached, but I would like to read you a few just of these plain English NIV says don't give the devil a foothold. The NASB says, don't give the devil an opportunity. New Century says, do not give the devil a way to defeat you. Uh, the contemporary English, don't give the devil a chance. And the NLT links the anger to a foothold that the devil might have. The, that, that translation links it. The Greek, mede didote. Topon. And mede didote topon to diablo. Neither give give place. This, by the way, didote is an imperative. That's all I'm going to say. It doesn't say think about it. And this topon, I have here a place, a seat, a region, an opportunity. And a footnote under that, which is property of any portion or space that is marked off, that is you. You belong to him. Just I want you to kind of attach some dots as to why this 
my mind gravitated to looking at this once I looked up the Greek. If this topon is property of any portion or space that is marked off, and God has placed his Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed on the day of redemption in you, it means you are a marked off person, marked off for him, chosen, called in him, which brings me back to a whole circle. There's the metaphorical interpretation here, which is the condition or state held by one in a company or assembly or the occasion for acting place, the occasion for acting. So let's just kind of put a few notes down here. There is no neutrality in spiritual warfare. There isn't. Much like when we've talked about faith, you're either going forwards or backwards. There is no neutral gear. There is no neutrality in spiritual warfare. You are either considering the fact that you are being considered. You are cognizant of the fact that you may even be in the process of being hindered, that you're not ignorant of Satan's devices, his schemes, his methods with man. All of these things are important. There's only one remedy here. You stand with or against Christ in this warfare. See, the battle's the Lord's. The battle's over you. That's, that's the hardest part of this. I said, it's the battle for the soul, but it's a battle for you. You read in the book of Job, why does it say that they were wrestling over the body of Moses? It's just a body. Or it's just a body unless you consider the fact that Moses appeared at the Mount of Transfiguration. It's just a body if you consider the fact that Moses was given by God to look on the promised land but not enter in. And yet, all of this favor regarding Moses mentioned in the New Testament, telling me that there's something more than just the body the tabernacle that was worn, being fought over. And why do you think you're any different? Why do I think I'm any different? No neutrality. The next thing I'm going to say here is it's either a direct or a not-so-direct attack on you. You know, there's people that exaggerate, and everything is the devil. Flip Wilson made that popular. Remember, the devil made me do it, right? Some of you are too young to remember that. I think I'm too young to remember that. <laughs> so I did like Geraldine, but anyway, never mind. Uh, but everything is the devil all the time. I've met those people. You know, they got grinds in their coffee in the morning. Ah, that devil was in their coffee pot. <laughs> but then there are people who don't see the indirect subtlety. And I'll give you an idea about something. You know, there are people who condemn people for drinking, smoking, cussing, whatever it is that a person does in their life. Which, by the way, I've said those are, those are the easy deliverances for God. It's the inner man or woman, spiritual pride, the things that are destructive that proceed out of the person that are destructive if you won't let God break them out of you. But they're not so direct attacks will not go to the thing that is the weakness of the individual, but rather the supplanting of God over that, whatever that is. For some people, it's food. For some people, it's sugar. For some people, it, you put wherever you want to put it, the devil can figure out how to make you desire something more. That, that he is good at. But again, observing habit patterns and watching the way you will, will the first thing be man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God Satan I rebuke you get out of my face get out of my head get out of my way now somebody, somebody hears you talking like this well <laughs> you stay away from that one but you who know what I'm talking about you understand there's, there's going to be some direct things where you say you can't miss that one well, I, could, I could catalog a few out of my late husband's ministry. Dr. Scott made a very bold statement. I understood what he said, but there were a lot of people that didn't when he said, God can't say no. There were a lot of people that didn't understand that. I knew exactly what he meant. It would, it would mean that what Christ did at Calvary wasn't enough. But to the average person who didn't understand the fullness of what he was saying, 
their thought process was, God can't say no, therefore he has to, and if he doesn't, he's a liar. But go back and listen to the hundreds of messages that he preached where he said, if you die down here holding on and claiming a promise, and you wake up in God's presence, you will wake up in God's presence. Still uttering those words, perhaps, perfectly healed. He never said anything else but that, his years of ministry, but somebody who couldn't understand the fullness of what he intended by what he said, took that to mean that when Dr. Scott was promoted, God said no. Well, that's a silly thing because every man and woman has their time here on earth. And only a person who is blatantly ignorant would think someone's going to be here forever. You live forever there. And maybe when we all come back later. But right now, no. But that was enough for some people. And the devil used that. So that's what I said to you, direct or indirect. Sometimes we don't perceive that. We think if it's a direct blow, it's right to me, and it's going to be so obvious. But there's these indirect things the devil will use. Be guarded about these things. The next one is the caricatures of the devil. C.S. Lewis said, No clever argument of bad eggs will ever make a good omelet. No amount of cartoon drawings will ever make people understand how the devil really operates. C.S. Lewis was right. Screw tape letters. If you haven't read it, please do. The rookie conversation between the main and the rookie demon. We never had it so good. People don't believe in us. The fact of the matter is that there's not too much talk about real spiritual warfare. There's a lot of people who want to talk about the best you and the best life and the things you're going to get, but the real warfare of it all if people talk about it, it's kind of in cartoon land. Now, I'm talking to you as a person of faith. I'm, now I'm going to step away from Pastor Scott role. I'm going to talk to you as a person of faith. There are a lot of things the devil can come to me as, but not as a caricature. It's the one area where I've said, in my mind, it's pretty clear. Because there's all these different opportunities. There's You open your door, your house, your friendship, your fellowship to somebody, the devil can use that. Your generosity, the devil can use that. But for some, it's just a caricature. It'd have to be something so blatantly and so overtly over the top, obvious, you'd say, well, of course, it's the devil. Last thing is facing the facts. I told you I was going to use two scriptures, so let's face the facts. The facts are, if you Go back and just read the book of Ephesians as I put those little headers on. You understand if you are indeed called, chosen, and unified in the body, then the devil's tactics and the devil's desire and his goal is to disunify, to disconnect, to have you in a state where you will no longer be looking to Christ. I said you're either standing with Christ or you're standing against. And there isn't anything in the middle when it comes to this subject. So... The sixth chapter, which we visited many times before, beginning at verse 10. And while you're turning there, let me just tell you, if you keep reading, you're going to see the unity uh, of what I've been pointing out continues with the relationship between husbands and wives, although that's brilliant information for us to understand how the role of a husband and wife are to function, but it ultimately brings us back to the unity that the couple has in Christ, in the church, the same thing is true with the children and parents. The same thing at the time when this was written. People had servants and masters. So a clear role of conduct in unity in all things. And then verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. It doesn't say be strong in you. You can do it. It says be strong in the Lord. It's rhetorical what I'm going to ask, but how do you be strong in the Lord? Do you bite your lip and say, I can, I will? Or you say, Christ, my victor and conqueror. Christ has already overcome. I'm going to go in and claim a promise, whatever thing that's coming against me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. A little bit out of context, I've taught you that. But hold on to something out of God's word and say, I will be strong in the Lord. I, not, I will not will myself to be strong. I will receive my strength from him. Why? Because when I am weak, 
then I can be strengthened by him. When I feel like I, I can do it, you better look out. You're going to be on your butt sooner than you know. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God. That means you are to protect yourself. And that doesn't mean you protect yourself, but the whole body is being considered, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to, to stand against the wiles, the methods, the methodias of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies, the high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. There's a repeat again of something that you may be, may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate plate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation, literally to receive it, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And we've got this admonition still here, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit. There's that same connectivity and unity that I was talking about watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may, may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds and so forth. The facing of the facts, either the Apostle Paul had, had lots of issues about the devil. This is, this is a very subtle point I'm going to make. You will not find this type of understanding about spiritual warfare, as he described, remember, he's a Jew, has an experience with the risen Christ and now becomes the proclaimer and the herald of Christianity. There is no background for this except for the book of Job. There is no background for this in Jewish thinking. Oh, there's, there is concepts of, we'll call them spiritual things. There are admonitions to not go, for example, and to seek a medium. The book of Leviticus cautions against people going to seek out those type of you know, advisors, spiritual mediums, or whatever. But this type of information is quite unique to the New Testament. And that doesn't mean that, that somehow the devil just appeared here. No, we know we've got a picture painted very clearly in the book of Isaiah that talks about between Isaiah and Ezekiel that gives us a clear picture of when Lucifer fell, that gives us a clear picture of the activities in the heavenlies. But into the New Testament, you've got this unique information right here. When I say it's unique, the only other place where you'll find the wealth laid down like this is in the temptation of Christ and through the gospel records of people who were possessed by what the King James translates devils unclean spirits. Now, that's not to say that they didn't exist before, but the instructions given here, considering who is writing them, staggering. Now, either this man had a lot of demon issues, or what he was telling us, advising us, giving us the information about is something that is quite real, and I believe it's quite real, because he's basically talking about taking a stand against these evil forces that come against the saints. And if you think about it, the whole armor describes the whole entire being. The feet, if you want to talk about it, everywhere that you walk, everywhere that you go, your head, the thoughts that come in your head. These are susceptible places of things that we're constantly buffeted by. So when we face the facts, this is either a real reality and it's a wake-up call for some who've been walking around saying, I haven't been bothered. I'm going to ask you a question. Just think about this. If the devil just kind of draws back for a season and comes out to do his bidding again, you might say, well, maybe I'm actually making a dent somewhere in the kingdom of God. Or maybe you've just kind of taken a back seat in complacency and you think your part in the kingdom is very little or has no substance to it, and therefore your whole mindset is, no one's bothering me. I've told you, major ministries. Somebody asked me, how can these people gather and it's hundreds of thousands of people gathering to listen to somebody talk about something syrupy and good. Well, it makes them feel good. And the devil's saying, come on in, there's a free seat right over there. Come on in, sit down right there. There's a free seat right there. Why? Because 
We don't have to talk about the blood of Jesus or that nasty old cross that he hung on. We don't have to talk about the good news of being washed and cleansed and forgiven and being made whole or the eternal purposes and his redemptive plan for humankind. We just got to talk about your flesh. And if your flesh feels good, by golly, the devil's going to leave that ministry alone. So what I'm telling you is you better wake up a little bit and by God's power, and by God's Holy Spirit, I'm asking those people who have been in a state of complacency today to recognize there is no neutral gear, there is no middle ground. You never stopped being a child of God, and you never stopped being a target. Now, not to operate in fear and say, now, well, now what do I do? I'm in a panic. No, greater is he that is in me. And what has been placed in me is God's Spirit to say, He's already got the victory. I have to be vigilant. The call for me is to stand, to keep faithing, and to keep strong in the faith. Let me go back to that first thing, and then I'm done, when it says, be strong in the Lord. Why? Well, that's the way the battle's going to be won. Not you being strong in you, but you be strong in the Lord, which requires you to be doing all the things, praying, faithing, putting on the helmet, whatever it is that he spells out here. It's good information for those people who know and are not ignorant about the fact that called and chosen means marked and highly desired, being considered, at times hindered. But guess what? Just like Paul, in that great passage where it says, knocked down but not out, buffeted but not broken. Well, you and I are the same way, just like that. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, including fighting the devil. The last word from James is what? If you resist the devil means there's an awareness there. You resist the devil, he'll flee from you. You want to hang out with him, that's your business. I don't. <laughs> so that's all I've got to say to you. Keep on fighting, friends. Fight the good fight of faith. Come on, band. Come on up. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.